Our last uh, presentation, though, is on simulating the adversary to create better detections. It's from the folks at Splunk. Uh, Dave Harold is a staff security strategist for Splunk. He's currently focused on the Splunk boss of the SOC, performing research on adversary simulation for blue teams, training, and enabling technical security sales teams around the globe, and helping Splunk customers implement advanced security cases. Ryan Kovar is a principal security strategist for Splunk. Prior to that, Ryan worked at DARPA on a team dedicated to detecting and mitigating advanced threats. He moved on to Splunk as a staff security strategist, where he continues to help with IR, hunting, and solving fun problems. Please welcome Ryan Kovar and Dave Harold. Let's click. Let's click our way to success. There we, there we go. go. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Harold. I'm Ryan Kovar. I'm the handsome one. It's a picture of us from last week at, down at the, the Splunk uh, factory floor. It's a, it's a cruel vendor uh, if you've never worked for them, but that's actually um, Splunk indexes right there. <laughs> that's right. Um, a little disclaimer that we always have to put in, although we, we customized it a bit. Uh, don't make any major life decisions based on anything we're about to show you today. No promises of fitness for purpose uh, or just fitness in general. No, but, um, so let's move on here. So I'm Dave Harold. <laughs> it is very, it is, it is very good. Right, right. <laughs> We've used it for a long time, and it's very good. Legal will find out one day. Um, so I, I, I'm Dave. I work at Splunk. Been there for a few years. I've uh, been around in security for, for, for quite a while. Done a lot of different jobs from uh, analyst, engineer, to, to uh, all the way up to CISO for, for uh, payment card companies. So uh, one of the things we do at, at Splunk is the boss of the SOC. We'll talk about it a lot today. Um, we kind of use it to, to, as, a, as a vehicle for, for having a lot of fun, but also teaching a lot of people about security. I'm Ryan Kovar. Uh, like I said, I've been at Splunk for about four years. I get to travel all over the world, do cool things. Uh, this is my fourth conference in four weeks, so uh, and it's one of the best ones I've been to in the last two years. So very happy to be here. Yeah. So so before before we we go there, since we're the last talk of the day, um, we thought we'd take the opportunity to thank all the folks from MITRE and um, the that the event staff, especially the um, event staff. They're often overlooked for these yep. things. Uh, it's fairly seamless to everyone here. But when we do these conferences, we see how well it goes and everything that happens. So truly, thank you guys for helping LDAV, making it all work. Thank you to the CFP board, the people running it, the MCing. It's not easy to do. We've done it. And this has gone really well for a first conference. Yeah, it's very impressive. Um, so uh, this is something we always put in. So Ryan and I do a lot of talks together. We do a lot of research together. Um, one thing we try to always do is, is kind of bring some, some, some core value from a security perspective. Um, not product specific, although um, today in particular there's a little more product in some of the stuff that we put out there. But um, rest assured, the stuff that we're going to talk about and show today are things that you can do with lots of different tool sets. Okay, they're not. We're not here to to pitch one one tool over another. But I do need more hoodies. They're not free. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about today. Um, number one. Um, uh, emulating an adversary or creating an APT, which is something that we do every year um, as part of our as part of our boss of the SOC, um, and we're increasingly starting to map that exercise onto um, the attack framework and using the attack framework to help inform um, how we create that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. It's actually a really fun exercise to go through. Um, We'll talk about some simulation tooling that we built recently that's built on top of, of Splunk and Splunk Phantom and ways to um, use that to emulate adversaries and to create data that you can then use to in turn create detections. Um, and we'll give away a bunch of free stuff in the form of uh, links to GitHub. It's, <laughs> it's, it's maybe not that fun, but um, we always like to bring something. So we have a lot of free uh, um, open source tools that you can use and implement some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. But first. But first. This is the last talk of the day. It's been a very long day. And much like my Bernie's Mountain Dog, everyone is starting to yaw subconsciously. <laughs> um, so what I love is for the five or 600 people who are in this room and the thousands online, Dave, if you wouldn't <laughs> mind, go ahead and stand up. Come on, stand, stand up. up. Shake it out. It's the last talk. We're boring people. We need you guys to get the heart racing. All right, yep. Send <laughs> your back to the military. Yep, one, two, three, one, two. All right, stand up. 
All right, now, if you have never been a red teamer, sit down. All right, so there's about, what, 280, 300 people still standing, I think, up here? <laughs> um, okay, next one, Dave. If you've never automated your red teaming, sit down. This is the right mm -hmm. conference for automation of red teaming. Final question. If you've never been a fake nation, say APT group, sit down. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's oh, impressive. Nice. Okay, we have people who are faking <laughs> nation state APTs. Uh, where's the FBI officer? Yep, right there. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and sit down, everyone. Uh, Dave and I do this every year. We create one of the world's largest CTFs. I'll put an asterisk there because we can't find metrics. Called Boss of the Sock. Uh, we run about 2.9 of these a week globally, and then we run a very large one once a year. Uh, at our Splunk World Conference, we had 720 people sit through it in one room for seven hours or for five hours. We're very proud of it. We try to make it extremely realistic, right? That's one of our big things. So um, what we do is we go through and we think to ourselves, what would Edward Hopper do, an American realist, right? We'd go through, we gotta keep this as real as possible because I am really tired, so tired of bullshit marketing stuff, to be honest, right? White teams, they do great jobs. Red teams do great jobs. But a lot of times they don't actually emulate what adversaries are doing on networks. And so what we did, the very first time we did this, we went through and we basically did a smorgasbord of APT actors, right? A buffet. We went, I like yeah. to call it a buffet. A buffet. He's Midwestern. So we went down to South America, picked a couple things from there, went over to China, picked a couple things there. Then we went to Russia, we picked up a whole bunch, and then we got a little scared. Uh, I don't know why. Something, something <laughs> happened. Um, and that's when we created the first boss of the SOC data set, which was a fake nation state. Uh, we kind of called it, a, we made it a joke, we called it Poison Ivy, which is a fun inside joke that ended up causing me no end of pain. But we really went into it. So you can actually create a full Maltigo graph. We had fake Skype accounts, we had Google Voice accounts that had uh, voicemails, we had Twitter accounts, we had domains, we had intentional misspellings in domains. Any TTP you could think for an APT actor that we had seen in our combined 40 years of hunting and IR, we tried to put in this, right? And it was a huge success. Such a huge success, Splunk said, we love this, we want you to do it again. We had thousands of customers around the world who were like, yes, make it bigger, make it better, but less smorgasbordy. <laughs> so we said, okay, how do we do this? So we created an APT group that we call Tadong Gong. Um, Tadong Gong, you'll see a little bit here in a second. What we did is we created, I don't know if Andy Pendergast is still here, uh, but the Threat Connect folks, he very drunkenly allowed me to take their format here, so I always give a call out. This is the diamond model. Most of you are very familiar with this. And this should look fairly realistic to what an APT group might look like. Right? You have, you have technical, you have socio-political, you have capabilities, things like this. So how do we create this diamond model? We went to ThreatMiner. We started downloading a whole bunch of APT reports. Right? ThreatMiner, of course, is tied to the APT notes, uh, malware repos. There's a whole bunch of different things go through and we started doing all these notes and I started creating and I, I hated myself this day. I, I hated it. I created a spreadsheet, looked like a, looked like a matrix. Um, and then we said, man, there's got to be a better way. Oh, yeah, there was. So last year when we did this, we actually used, and we kind of reversed this compared to what I think most people are doing with the attack matrix. We actually went through and started applying the layers for the APT groups that we wanted to emulate and then select the tactics out of there to put into our CTF. So completely kind of turned it on its head and went bottom out, right? So what this meant was we were able to do things and then tie this into the atomic red team or other things, actually pull out and put into our CTF the actual quantified knowledgeable things that Casey and others have put into atomic red team that are based on citable research that was found in the MITRE ATT&CK framework and then put that into our CTF, right? So if we had ever had, as I have, uh, you know, we once had a customer come up to me and say, this is completely unrealistic, I'm a pen tester, and this would never happen. I was like, what? She's like, add user? <laughs> no APT actors, advanced, Ryan, stands for advanced. I was like, well, okay, I get it, but you know, here's the T number, and here's the 75 malware reports that show evidence of a nation state actor using add user. <laughs> oh, right, the whole idea here is a scientific method we've gone through, we've reversed it, and we have citable knowledge. It's an awesome educational tool. But uh, we're really lazy, and this year we want to try something new. I'll turn it over to Dave. Okay, so um, one of the things that, that uh, 
we do every year is, is um, our big user conference. It's where we do our boss of the sock, and we're always expected to come up with talks. So um, this year, um, we created some advers adversary emulation tooling that, that sits on, on top of Splunk. Um, there's a couple guys that worked on this a lot, so myself um, and, and Tim and Kyle. So we presented this a couple weeks ago at our, at our user conference. So a lot of the tooling, we did a full 45-minute presentation on that. If you want to check that out, it goes in deep into all the kind of bits and bytes um, but and the, uh, here, here's a link to the slides in the video. Um, but I'll kind of talk about uh, what this tooling is and how we how we used it for for some of the stuff we did in this talk. So um, basically, we created um, a, what I like to say is kind of like a rapid iteration, a rapid development environment for for developing um, data that you can use to generate analytics. So. Um, I'll just walk through this real quickly, but um, if you start with um, kind of a Splunk platform, um, we integrated the attack navigator into a Splunk dashboard, um, which in and of itself is kind of a neat thing. Um, could reduce some spreadsheets possibly. Um, so we have an attack navigator. I'll show you some screenshots of that in a bit. We added some, some sort of custom actions to that, the right-click right actions to select a technique and run that essentially against um, systems of, of your choice in order to generate data. So we have um, the attack navigator as kind of the front end, a simulation runner, which allows you to add some, some configuration options in. Um, and then we send that over to Phantom. Phantom's another Splunk product that we acquired earlier this year. It's, it's an orchestration and automation platform. Um, so we built um, an Atomic Red Team app for that. So it downloads the Atomic Red Team uh, GitHub repo or repo from GitHub, stores it locally, and then allow, exposes actions for, for running those, uh, those tests against systems of your choice. And we wrote a playbook that implements those, um, those actions or puts them into use. Uh, if you look at the, the lower kind of right there, we have systems. Um, in, in this case, uh, and I've heard the, the term, by the way, uh, this week, or the you know, last couple of days, the perfect being the enemy of the, the good. And I never have that problem. So if you, if you look at this code, um, you'll be like, hey, here's a, here's a person who's, not, who's willing to publish things that are um, just barely working. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll see literally, that. Literally the only reason, we swear <laughs> to God, we just that's right. we don't want to um, be accused of perfection. That's right. Uh, the, the, the dashed lines down there around OS 10, or should say Mac OS and Linux, or because that's the playbook isn't, isn't done for those, but we have it working for Windows. Um, but ultimately, we run these atomic red team tests that represent MITRE attack techniques. Um, against Windows in this case, and this is a system that should um, represent your, your fleet, right? It should have the controls that you have in place on your systems, right? It should be representative. We have a, a Splunk Universal Forwarder on there that forwards the logs over um, back into Splunk. I should say on the Windows system, we kept it pretty simple. We just put Sysmon um, and a, a decent sort of Windows um, lo logging policy plus Sysmon with the, the uh, Taylor Swift on security um, configuration, which is pretty standard, I think. Um, and then we, we send that data right back into, into Splunk. Um, the way we originally delivered this was kind of talking about some of the detections that we, that we have in some of our products. But for, for this talk, I want to instead talk about, OK, when that data comes back into Splunk, which is an analytics platform, um, how do you then use that to maybe build new detections um, that are, that are custom, customized to your environment but are um, driven by the, the MITRE attack techniques and um, by the, the uh, atomic red team tests. All right. So yeah, atomic red team, I, I said to, to throw this out here because we, none of the stuff that we did would have been possible without having a library of, of tests. So I'm, I'm um, actually really glad he did because this is a relatively unknown tool. Uh, especially in MITRE ATT&CK. So if you haven't heard of Atomic Red Team, <laughs> you should definitely check it out. There's some presentations. Yeah. So um, anyway, thanks to those guys. I, I tweeted yesterday about this, but I, I just you think the world of, of the folks at Red Canary because I, I just the, the, the amount of stuff that they contribute back to the community is really um, amazing. They set a really, really good example for vendors um, that, that I think you know, from the vendor side, we should all try and, and follow like that level of commitment. I'm, I'm pretty impressed by that. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, the, the attack navigator, obviously, very powerful tool, spreadsheet killer. Um, 
So this is something that we really wanted to, to, to put into a dashboard inside of, of Splunk. So we, we created this, uh, this app that does exactly that. Um, and you can check that out. I think if, if nothing else, we package this up as its own thing. It's not really part of all the rest of the tooling um, because it, it might be useful to, to a lot of folks out there. It was not easy to do. Um, one of those guys whose picture I showed earlier um, spent a lot of time getting the, the, the two styles of JavaScript, I'll say, uh, to, 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 to live happily together. But um, one of the things that, that we did, I think the primary thing we wanted to accomplish was to make it into a front end for this tooling that we built. Um, and it, it's pretty easy, actually, in the attack navigator to build, like, new, to add in new, like, right click actions or new context actions. So we added one. Um, it says run demo up there, but it should say, like, run test or run technique. Um, and you can, you can add in um, those types of things. So it makes, real, makes it really easy for a user to click on that. Um, it takes them ultimately to another page where they select like, hey, which of those targets do I want to run this against? Um, those types of things. And then um, ultimately kicks off that, that series of events. So um, one of the things that, that became obvious, and I, I really enjoyed the, the talks, especially this morning, um, good talks from, from Kyle and from uh, the, the guys at Endgame. And um, the reason I, was, I liked those talks so much is because they were bringing up topics that if you actually are building detections against the, the, the techniques in MITRE, that things that you, they're, they're things that you run up against, right? Um, and you can just kind of tell when people have actually done it. And you just <laughs> nod your head like, yeah, I've been, been down that road before. So um, kind of in that vein, one of the things that, that, we, that we ran into, right, was sort of um, isolating the results of these tests. So when you run the test, it's going to generate some logs. And trying to figure out exactly um, which, what, what events were a result of the test running, what, uh, what are just background noise of things happening on the system, and you know, what might be part of what I call scaffolding, right? So um, when you build an automated framework to push these things out to a remote system, you're going to have used something to do that. Like in our case, we rely on WinRM in a lot of cases, right? Um, WinRM could be an adversary tool, right, in some cases. So um, you have to be careful um, to, 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 to isolate the, the things that you want to write your detections on. So we um, created this concept of, or not created, but we thought of this, this concept, very simple, but basically writing logs, purposely writing logs. I think somebody mentioned a similar technique this morning, but write, writing something in, into the log that you can key off of. So we create a GUID. Um, we, in Splunk, we write to that to, to, to our index, and we say, hey, we're about to kick off this test. And when it reaches Phantom, Phantom says the same thing, writes to the same index with the same GUID, like, hey, we received the message. We're about to kick off this test. And then even to the point um, where on the Windows system itself, we put into the playbook so the, the, that the Windows system will write such a log, right, with the same GUID to its, um, to its logs using like a, just a command line um, event create command. Um, and then we do the same thing at the end, right? Write those same three events. Um, and then when we go to, to look at this from, uh, from a, a, a detection capability point of view, right, we can look at, we can find the start event, we can find the end event. Um, we can turn that into, uh, you know, two epoch you know, timestamps, and that gives us a range of time that we specifically want to look at, and we can uh, eliminate everything else. So um, that was something that helped us a lot. If, if you're you know, embarking on this kind of, uh, of a project, I would recommend using this technique. It, it, it turned out to, to um, kind of power a lot of, uh, uh, made it a lot easier to do a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish. So um, if you look at the bottom here, there's a couple things. We, we only had Sysmon, right? So, um, but you know, in, in your environment, maybe you have carbon black, or maybe you have, you know, uh, tanium, or you might even have other controls that aren't host-based, right, that you expect to fire when you see certain things. Like maybe you have, yeah, I don't know, your next-gen firewall, or your IDS or something, and you're hoping those things, or expecting those things to, to capture certain of these techniques, right? So um, that's, that would totally work just fine in this, in, in this world. Um, in this case, I'm only showing Sysmon, again, um, the, 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 the minimum, minimum viable uh, MVT, minimum viable talk. Um, so that, that was the uh, um, only showing Sysmon, but there could be lots of other, um, lots of other controls that you have in place there. Um, some 
that kind of the sysma not event code equal one um, is kind of showing um, some things that we found in this particular example, which was the um, you know creating a registry for a start event or a, a startup item. Um, so you see there's um, some evidence in the sysmon um, uh, item or uh, event code 13 showing that a registry change was made. Um, and then down below, you see a, a few things. There's a little bit of the scaffolding that I mentioned kind of sneaking in there. Those first few events are, are saying uh, started a test on a certain IP address. Um, but then ultimately, it actually shows command lines that were run um, executing that, that technique. So um, then we get down to sort of writing the analytic. Um, there's been actually some, some really good talks already today on, on, on how to sort of tune an analytic or the, the, the sort of um, the path that you go through, right? The, the sort of stages that you go through in writing an analytic. You find something, you know, you write a search that finds that thing. You realize, oh, I kind of overfit to that example. Um, that's, you know, not finding things because of that. And then you, you, you know, you adjust the other way and then you start getting false positives and, you know, finding the right, um, the, the, the right sort of uh, balance there is kind of different for every organization. But in this case, um, we just a simple, a pretty simple Splunk search here. We're, um, that first line in the search is looking for our two um, uh, uh, timestamps, right? The beginning and end, which we got from um, taking the time to write those start and end events. Uh, we're doing some decoding. Um, the way that we are sending the data in to, um, to, to, to the Windows endpoint in this situation is using WinRM um, it, and then having it run a PowerShell command and PowerShell commands are encoded. Um, so another, another opportunity to, to mistake the delivery mechanism that we intended um, for, for something that's actually malicious. So you want to be aware of that. We do some decoding of the base64 there and um, ultimately um, you know, display that stuff. We again see those, um, we see some of those event create commands, but then ultimately we see you know, what the adversary was actually doing in, in that test. Um, and um, you, know, you can write your, your detection on that, right? You can look for, you know, look for certain strings, look for command line options, right? Um, a lot of different techniques, I think, that, were, that have been described quite a bit already today, so I won't dwell on those. But um, you, know, you want to avoid anything that is easily changed by the adversary or that you would even expect the adversary to change, like you know, paths to, cert to certain, um, certain things and that, that um, I guess that sort of, uh, uh, sort of data that's, or the, the portions of that command line that are likely to change, right? You want to avoid those. So, um, in conclusion. In conclusion. Oh. Oh, one, one more thing. So we found as we were going through this, um, you know, I want to rain on the MITRE day for the last two days a bit. Um, we started doing these APT style groups. So we started using the MITRE attack framework and we started trying to map things. And we found some very exciting differences of opinion as you start trying to map <laughs> tactics. Uh, so one of the things we did uh, was we wrote up all the methods from the previous year that we had attacked an organization. And then we kind of did a blind test of ascribing techniques to those things. So today, I think today and yesterday, we've heard that MITRE attack is over-prescriptive, over and we've heard that it's under-prescriptive. Uh, so I think we, you know, somewhere in the middle is obviously the right place. Uh, I personally would always prefer to be over-subscriptive so that we can just have a better taxonomy of knowledge, uh, which kind of leads into the next part. Um, Taedong Gong last year, uh, new research came out for this APT group, <laughs> and we found out that there were actually two different APT groups uh, for Taedong Gong. They, the group had actually bifurcated, and now we have Taedong Gong Lager and Taedong Gong Stout. So, yes, I like beer. <laughs> so, the Taedong Gong Stout group is really premised of your, your traditional nation state adversary, brick and mortar, kind of going in for IP, doing that sort of stuff. All the things were pretty much, basically what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Taedong Gong Lager, however, is they're, they're the millennials of the hacker groups, right? <laughs> These are the kids who are all about the Bitcoins. They're all about the AWS and the Lambda functions. They're trying to get up all up into that Microsoft Office 365 cloud. They're trying to spin up VMs and AWS to run malicious things. And we said, this is awesome. 
let's really break some new ground, right? We're not hearing a lot about this. So cool, let's do this. Let's go right into the MITRE ATT&CK framework and God, we're gonna document the hell out of this. Oh, <laughs> sad cloud. Um, sad cloud, sad cloud. Uh, Taedonggong logger is still running rampant. Um, this sucks, frankly. This isn't a MITRE problem, this is an industry problem. Try to find cloud compromises online. Try to find documentation about people who've been popped in Office 365, AWS, Google, anything, right? The pretty much all you'll find is IAM compromises, which is still basically, you know, uh, there was a quote the other week at the SANS uh, Blue Team hunting con or the SANS hunting conference where someone said, you don't hack the uh, account you log in, right? That's what we're doing. Right, with the cloud, most of the time it's not hacking. It's not a sexy O-Day. It's really just hacking the human and getting a lo login and password. So it is difficult, and I don't envy those of us in the room who have been assigned, and I'm sure someone has, to trying to come up with documentation. Uh, I, for one, I'll stand right here and volunteer to help however I can. Um, I know Dave is. I would love for the rest of the room and the community to contribute more to this, because we don't get to have tasty things like MITRE ATT&CK frameworks without tasty data to put into it. Right, so that's my call to action for everyone in the room and myself. Um, so this is the crap that we ended up with for Taedong Gong Logger. <laughs> uh, we had to pretend. We had to put on our how would I hack the cloud. You'll notice the fidelity for this is significantly less than Taedong Gong Stout. Each one of those I was mostly able to. Sometimes I was talking to people and like writing things on a napkin like if this happened, blink twice. You know, no <laughs> one's willing to comment on it. No one's willing to be able to give me data. I can't look in the logs. And God forbid you try to look at logs in either of these two platforms, they can get either underwhelming or overwhelming really fast. Um, so we've had some practical experience kind of delving into this. I'm looking forward to advances in the MITRE cloud. Like I said, please help them and we'll help and everyone should help. So now an actual WikiHow conclusion. An actual conclusion. So um, yeah, hopefully there, there's a few ideas here that, that you can take away. The, I think the first one, obviously, if you're at this conference and you're still here at this conference, you believe that adversary simulation is helpful and that you know it can help with lots of things, in particular security analytic development, which is something that we spend a lot of time on. Um, I think that the tooling is increasingly available. There's a lot of vendors here, um, there's at least a couple of vendors here, that do exactly that, that, that thing that I cobbled together, right, in a much more comprehensive and professional way. So um, there's also, you know, as evidence, I guess, by this talk, there's things popping up uh, out there. I know the, the whole reason I wanted to do this entire project was, um, a talk that I saw from, from Chris Gates last year about his meta project. So that kind of tooling is out there um, and increasingly available. Um, and so I'd say, you know, take advantage of it. Um, one of the things I, I just love, I remember when the purple team uh, term came out and I was a little dubious at first. Um, and now I absolutely love it. I'm a huge advocate for it. And I feel like it's really come to its own in the last couple months or last year or so. Uh, we had a lot of talks today for people who've productionalized purple teaming. It's no longer, let's just put the red team and the blue team in the same room and see what happens. Uh, I love the talk by the, the Deloitte guys from the Netherlands, Olaf and Vincent, where they actually talked about a defined process and the value that can be extracted from implementing these two people and getting that knowledge into the blue team. And, uh, you know, of course, if that doesn't work, if that's too big of an issue, uh, uh, tiny purple? Was tiny it? purple? Tiny purple? Little yeah. purple? Little purple? Just, just micro purple. Micro purple. Go. I thought it was, was micro was purple. Just do a little purple if you can't do the whole purple. And of course, if nothing else, I feel like we're all going to be employed at least for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, we haven't solved cyber. Uh, but what I love about MITRE ATT&CK, the reason I am an absolute advocate for it, it gives us a language and a taxonomy to have conversations like this that I've never been able to have before. Um, and like I said, my, my area of research for the next year is cloud. And I want to be able to have those conversations where we're not just talking two different languages as soon as possible. Yep. Uh, so if you're interested in some of the stuff I was, I was talking about earlier, here's links to, to everything. We'll, we'll tweet those out. Um, we kind of broke them up into pieces that we thought people might be interested in uh, separately. Um, the attack navigator, Splunk, these are all on my, my GitHub right now. We'll, getting them into the proper you know, ways to, to distribute these for our day job. But um, they're on, on in, out on GitHub right now. So the attack navigator and a Splunk dashboard is one app. Um, a simulation runner for Splunk, which is kind of some plumbing um, that would make all that possible, or that helps make all that possible. And then there's a playbook for Phantom, and, or excuse me, a simulation playbook for Phantom and an Atomic Red Team app And I, I would point out as well that 
both of these can be run Phantom and Splunk on the free versions of Splunk. Yeah. So there's no need to go out and buy a whole bunch of Splunk. I mean, you should because Papa needs a new Ferrari. But <laughs> otherwise, you can run it all for free, especially when you're doing dev and test. Yeah, this is uh, actually, it's a, it's a use case that drives literally kilobytes of log volume into, into your Splunk instance, like on a weekly basis. So yeah. and it's not, not, not a huge, uh, uh, not a huge uh, yeah. data consumer. So um, definitely feel free to check out the free versions. I'm Ryan Kovar. I'm Dave Harold. Thanks a lot. <laughs>